I cannot believe that 10 weeks has gone by. It seems like just yesterday, if it wasn't for the change in the weather, I would never have known that 10 weeks would possibly have gone by. As we begin every program here at the Silver Sides, we begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you are able, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tom is going to be kind enough to move the slides for us. We've tried everything with that little clicker. Guess it's time to buy a new one. So, there we go. We would like to thank the Birch Foundation for their wonderful support of this series. As you, those of you that have been with us each and every week, I talk endlessly about how wonderful this, um, this foundation is, about a couple that served their country during World War II and then came back and picked up lives of public service. And with their family, they instilled in them the values of public service. And they felt that education was key to people wanting to do public service. And upon their death, their family set up this foundation in their memory, and they assist us with educational programs such as this. And we couldn't do it without their support. So we're very eternally grateful to the Birch Foundation for their continued support of our series. Next slide. We're also very proud to say that Blue Lake is our media sponsor. They do an excellent job of assisting us in getting the word out about our programming. And without them, we could do not do any of these things. Next slide, please. If you have enjoyed this lecture series, please consider making a year-end donation to the museum. As all of you know, because you've all been here with us so many times, the museum does not receive any state, federal, or local funding. Everything that happens at this museum, from preservation of our artifacts, from the submarine and the Coast Guard cutter, to all of the artifacts that are in the building, as well as all of our educational program, is done through the generosity of our community as well as admission sales and gift shop sales. And so if you are interested in making sure that this series continues going on to educating a lot of people about what our veterans did, please consider making a year-end donation to us. Next slide, please. Upstairs in our channel view room, we are very lucky to have a group of dedicated veterans and their spouses put up a Christmas tree for us each and every year. The flags on the tree represent everyone from Muskegon County that died during the Vietnam War. And if we take a moment, there's not a very long list, and these are why we do what we do here. And so I would just like to read off the names of those that passed away during the Vietnam conflict from our community. In the Air Force, we had Russell Fry, Lewis Canner, Donald King. In the Army, Roger Berg, James Cameron, Nicholas Charles, Gerald Collies, James Cutler, James Dinger, Barry Dula, Cleveland Dykes, Daniel Erlenbaugh, Armando Escarino, David Flannery, Richard Jurie, Jero, excuse me, Robert Gosen, <coughs> Robert Grover, James Hobson, Gary Hosko, Thomas Howard, Stephen Kidd, James Klein, Ray Noel, Stephen Langler, Douglas Mallet, William McLeod Jr., Daryl Morey, Howard Painter, Antonio Ponce, Thomas Robinson, Michael Rocky, Sylvester Sagan, Sagan Raymond Schleindecker, Kenneth Simmons, James Trudeau, Philip Troughton, Kenneth Voss, Davey Vinnery. And then in the Navy, we had Bruce Laporte, John Lenning, Joseph Krywicki, Philip Stevens, 
And in the Marines, we have James Achterhoff, Delbert Brimmer, Kevin Clark, Jerry Cole, Robert Davidson, Roger Edwards, Gerald Hendricks, Gabriel Harada, David Camp, James Coy, Ronald Crossy, Dennis Lenore, Stanley Lewandowski, Bernard Novak, Danny Riceberg, Gerald Van Dockler, Richard Voorhees. Uh, and <clears throat> it is, <clears throat> excuse me, in the memory of these people, they were so proud to be able to honor their memory. And it's through series like this that people get to understand what it is that they fought for and how it is that they passed away during their time in combat and their sacrifice to our country. And so we appreciate each and every one of them for their service to our community. And we thank them for all that they've done. On our tree upstairs, there is a flag for each and every one of these gentlemen that passed away during the conflict. Next slide, please. It's impossible to think that we are 10 weeks into our, our series. We have covered so many unique topics that we're not very often covered. We oftentimes talk about the Army in Vietnam. We got a great time to hear about what their service was like. We talked about the Army nurses. The one that no one ever talks about very often, but just as important, was the Coast Guard in Vietnam. The Air Force in Vietnam, the Marines in Vietnam, the Navy in Vietnam, another one that people don't often talk about. The Silver, um, our two Silver Star awardees from two weeks ago. Last week, Ron Janowski did an exceptional presentation on the home front. And tonight, <coughs> um, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Fred Johnson, will be talking about how the conflict has affected all future military conflicts in the United States and how it's influenced the political aspect of it as well in decisions that are made that affect our military. It'll be another wonderful presentation. And it's just been delightful to be able to share that with each and every one of you <coughs> here this evening. And for those of you that are at home, or for those of you that are here and you have people that know that you would like to be able to watch these afterwards, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, frog in my throat there. They are available on the YouTube channel for the museum. All you have to do is go to our website, go to videos, and then you'll see a playlist for each of the different series that we've had. And we've been, um, Tom and I were talking about this, I think we've been doing series here at the museum for about nine years. Twelve, I think our first series was in 2012. And since that point, we have been doing lectures on military history ever since. And it's been a wonderful time to be able to share and learn about those that gave so much to our, our country free the way it is. And we appreciate that. And so for anyone that's not here with us tonight, that has missed any of the lectures or you'd like to share it with them, just please go to our YouTube channel and you'll see our entire listing of all the lectures we've had here at the museum. Next slide, please. <coughs> our, <coughs> sorry, frog in the throat here tonight. Our spring lecture series starts the third week in February of next year. I was doing the budget today, so my years are all mixed up and I feel like losing a whole year for COVID. So spring of 2022, the third Monday in February is the first night of our lecture. And we will be talking about that first night, the end of World War I in the intervening years of how it ended up causing a lot of the things that we saw in World War II. But because this is going to be World War II in the Pacific, we're going to be specifically looking at, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, the alliances that were formed, the rise of Japanese power, and how the war started before America got involved with Japan looking to bring in raw materials to its own country and taking over China and the rape of Nanking will be one of the major topics that we'll be discussing that very first night. We will go for 10 weeks after that and we'll end at the very first week of May. And we'll have many interesting topics to go on all of those different evenings. Next slide, please. This, Susie, he's not next week's presenter. He's the site's presenter. Sorry about that. 
Fred Johnson has been a wonderful speaker here at the museum for many years, and we appreciate his <coughs> knowledge and information that he can provide to us about military history. Being a veteran himself, he understands specifically when he does these presentations. We're here for the knowledge to understand why it is that we were involved and how our men and women of the military were affected by this and the conflicts that they were involved in. And Fred does an exceptional job. Fred brought us the beginning of our lecture series <coughs> and when he talked about how the United States got involved in Vietnam, which for a lot of people is a very murky area and it is not something that's oftentimes talked about. I was just reading a book on, um, called Ike's Bluff and it's about Eisenhower's time in office. And one of the major components of this book is how Eisenhower felt the ultimate responsibility as the world became more and more of nuclear powers and more and more nuclear bombs were developed and Russia got that nuclear bomb. How is it that they could avoid mutual destruction? And so many of the conflicts that we were involved in it was debated whether or not they would use the nuclear weapons in the nuclear arsenal that we had, but we haven't used them since that one time, the time at the end of World War II. So it's a very <coughs> interesting topic to talk about. As we wait for Fred to come, because we know he was in um, Grand Haven, but a few minutes coming over. So some of the other things that will be coming up at the museum in the near future. The museum is open year-round, and during the holidays, we are open seven days a week except for Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, and New Year's Day. So if you have any out-of-town guests that would be interested, we'd be very happy to have them here. We're open 10 to 4, Sunday through Thursday, and on Saturday, and, uh, Friday and Saturday, we're open 10 to 5.30. And we're enjoying having lots of people. This year, we've had more record numbers of actual in-person visitors than we have ever had. And we're very delighted to have them <coughs> here and back again in person. So um, while we wait for Fred, does anyone have any questions on the museum or anything about the submarine that I can answer for you? About how she got here from Chicago? Or um, how the Coast Guard Cutter got here from Chicago? Or any of those questions on any of that? and what the submarine was doing during World War, uh, during the Vietnam War. Anyone have an answer for where our submarine was during Vietnam? She was at the great, um, she was actually in Chicago, she was a reserve vessel, and she was used as a training vessel. And the way that they trained the submariners at that point was that most importantly is your temperament had to be correct to be a submariner. You could have all of the physical attributes, you could do everything, you could have the desire, but unless you were willing to be able to, and ability-wise, to be able to stay locked in a tube for a long period of time with a lot of other people, so they would have these reserve weekends, and then if someone was interested in becoming a submariner, it would give them a chance to see what it was like to be inside an actual submarine for a period of 72 hours. And if they could make it through that 72 hours, then they could consider applying to the submarine service. But there was no sense in that, because can you imagine the commanding officer? You have someone that thinks that they're absolutely well qualified to do this, and they think that this is going to be wonderful, and then when they find out claustrophobia is not their friend, or being confined is not their friend. So our submarine, after her service in World War II, continues her service as a training vessel until she became outdated and <clears throat> no longer was in use. And so that's where the Silver Sides was in Chicago at, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Naval Reserve Yard right off of Navy Pier during the 1960s. Before that, in the early 1940s, or excuse me, the late 1940s, post-World War II, she was up a little further north in Zion at the um, Great Lakes Naval um, Training Base there. And then she got moved down to Chicago, so yes. Were there any submarines used during the Vietnam conflict? Oh, yes, there was. <laughs> um, there, one of our gentlemen that volunteers here was um, on a submarine during the Vietnam conflict. With the submarines were used for a lot of the same things that they were used for now. Um, they were used for a lot of intelligence gathering. 
and they were used to be able to understand what was going on without being able to be seen and transporting people and equipment to them and surveillance. So yes, submarines were definitely used during Vietnam. So um, maybe that's Fred. <laughs> so yeah, but um, the night that we had the discussion on the Navy in Vietnam, that's one of those things that people don't think about much. The Navy in Vietnam or the Coast Guard in Vietnam. Because when you heard the stories and you saw the evening news, they're not the ones that made the news every night. They were off on the side and they just did not have a lot of publicity for them. But when you think of the number of planes that were flown off of aircraft carriers that did the sorties, that did the bombing runs, a lot of them were from the Navy. And then um, a lot of munitions and a lot of supplies were brought ashore by the Navy during Vietnam. And logistics, so important. Transport of staff and um, soldiers, very important. So, okay, um, any other questions that we have? Yeah, wasn't there a movie made uh, with pulling the submarine out? Yes. Michigan, yes, that movie is called Below. It's not my genre that I enjoy. It's um, a quasi horror film, and it's not quite my, my, you know, it's not quite the genre that I enjoy, but yes, it was filmed here by pulling the sub out into Lake Michigan. She was also used in a documentary on um, submarines in um, England by the BBC. And then most recently, there was a series of films called <coughs> Max Matson. There were children's films off of the Disney Channel or the Disney TV, uh, movie studios. And um, the one that was filmed here was with Copper Harbor. And it was about the, um, a submarine that was off of um, the UP and used to create all this like time traveling treasure <laughs> things. And again, not quite my genre, but it was very interesting to watch them make a movie here. Um, when the Silver Sides was portrayed in the TV series uh, on the Smithsonian Channel, Hell Below, they actually used the Pompanito in California, in San Francisco for that. Um, so, um, and then when they filmed several of the other ones, they were all on sound stages recreated in Hollywood. So those are the ones that were filmed here. And so without further ado, I will introduce our speaker for this evening, a man that needs no introduction and does always an excellent job for us, and we're so excited to have him here, Professor Johnson. Good evening, Super Science. Everybody join me in cursing traffic in Grand Haven. Yeah. <laughs> what a pleasure to be here with you all. I need to get the slide changer. I'm here. Oh, you are? Okay, great. I'm here, I have the honor of doing the last session of the, the Vietnam series, which has been really, really quite engaging and informative. You know, just when you think you know a thing about as well as you can, there's always more to learn about it. In Vietnam, there's no exception. I want to thank Ron Janowski for sending me some, some PowerPoint and some information that really gave me some inspiration and some guidance on how we put in this together, this last session. Vietnam, here endeth the lesson, or did it? Well, we can go into the first one. This coming May in 2022, if the pandemic finally backs off enough, I will be, ta I will be taking some students, my colleague Scott Randis Dupe and I, we take us some students to Vietnam for what's called the Vietnam May term. We did this in 2017, we did it in 2019. We of course didn't do anything in 2020 because of, well, the pandemic. Vietnam today, Vietnam today is something truly to behold. It's something to really see. Vietnam is a tourist destination. It's a very, very tour, it, you, it was a cheap place to go. It's becoming more and more expensive because more and more people are finding out about it and more and more people are realizing that it really is a nice place to go, get some good bargains, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful country. The people are friendly. The food is great. I always lose some weight when I go there, which is always a welcome thing. And there's just so much to be seen. And the Vietnamese are hard working, they're industrious, the terrace farming, the land is naturally beautiful. We've gone as far north as the Vietnamese Chinese border, 
And to see China with your own eyes is just amazing. It really is amazing. The country has many problems. It is, after all, a communist government. And there is a great deal of poverty there. And the classes there are the very rich and, in many cases, just everybody else. Still, there are remnants there in Vietnam of the old period of the history of Vietnam when the French were the colonizers and then came the Americans and of course there are still remnants of the Vietnam War. And the Vietnamese are very, very open about talking about those periods in their history. I don't know what city that was, I think this is Saigon. Saigon is still very much a, 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 a buzzing, busy place as it was for many American servicemen when they were over there. But this is the Vietnam that we see today. And the students, they, get, they of course, are very, very excited about it. They like what they see. They get caught up in the nightlife. They get caught up in the busyness of Vietnam and the, the glamour and the grandeur of it all. And they, they start thinking about how wonderful of a place it would be to work and maybe do an internship. But I'm there to remind them that Vietnam wasn't always like this. I'm there to tell them, wait, not so fast. The Vietnam you see today, there's another side to it. Because America's connection with Vietnam goes back a long, long way. I tell them that once upon a time, a time not so long ago, there were other young people, other young Americans who were not much older than they are, who were in Vietnam, and they saw Vietnam from a totally different perspective. Same land, same cities, people doing different things. Those young Americans were over there, and they were there moving around in UH-1H UH UH Huey helicopters. Those young Americans were there riding around in gunships, being dropped off at LZs, landing zones. Like yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, no, we were sharing just the logo of the museum on the, to the Zoom participants. So, that's probably my. That was probably my mistake when no, I switched right. over. We're back at you now. So okay. Good. I know. I know that for Vietnam veterans, Vietnam is still very much a live, mm -hmm. living reality. I did a presentation about maybe two years ago, and to start off the presentation. I went to YouTube and did the sound effect of, actually, there was a picture and a, a video and the sound of a UH-1H helicopter starting up. If you ever heard the wind-up of the jet engine of a UH-1H, you will never, ever forget it. And some people had physical reactions to that. Some got up and went out of the room. I didn't mean for that to happen. I was just trying to bring home the reality of the presentation. But those helicopters together must have made some awful racket as they were taking off. The young people who are in Vietnam during this period, People who were in Vietnam during this period, they had the hard, hard, hard job of taking up the duty for the next generation. Every generation of Americans has had to do the hard work of going off to a foreign land at the request of their president, at the request of their relatives, the way we used to do it in World War II, World War I, prior wars. President goes before the Congress and asks the, ask the nation's representatives, those people, 535 people in the Congress, asking permission for them to send other people's children to war. Now you've already known through all the sessions that we didn't do that. There was something called the War Powers Act, 
which gave President Johnson pretty much an open-ended blank check to respond to communist aggression in Southeast Asia by using any means he saw fit. And here's a key point, as we'll get to in just a little while. There was really no end game in sight. There was never ever a, any language about when the crisis would end, when the threat would be pushed back. At what point did we accomplish the mission? What was the mission? You can go to the next one. So much, so much from Vietnam came not just because of the helicopters, although the helicopters were a key point. The helicopters, Vietnam became the helicopter war. From the helicopters and medevacs, we get to make, today we have life flights that have saved many, many lives in the civilian world. The helicopters have become a lot more sophisticated than the ones you see here in this picture. Vietnam, you can see it, you could see it, and you can see it in the faces of those who were there. And the thing that always strikes me, fellow scholars of the Silver Sides Museum, is that it ever strikes me how young they were, how absolutely young they were. They gave of themselves at a very, very precious time in life. They were still in their formative years. These are, these are young adults, not adult adults. These are young adults who are still forming their attitudes and beliefs around the world, and then they're thrown into the fire to defend their country or to, to help defend another country. And they came from all background, all classes, all places, all in the same spot. In a country very far away from home, all of them experiencing the same thing. Missing loved ones, enduring the weather, enduring hardship, enduring stress, and facing an enemy that would prove to be implacable in the final analysis. It was chaotic. But war is always chaotic. But this was different because Vietnam, unlike World War II, some historians have referred to World War II as the last good war. Well, first of all, there really is no such thing as a good war. But if you're going to use that phrasing, let's put it like this. The last war when you can really tell who an enemy was. German soldiers, Nazis wearing Nazi uniforms. Japanese soldiers wearing Japanese uniforms. In Vietnam, very much like the Philippine insurrection from 1899 to 1901, very difficult to tell who enemies were since people were using, knowingly using civilians or hiding among civilians to launch attacks and conduct guerrilla warfare. I have been to Ku Chi and tried to imagine in that network of 300 miles of tunnels in villages in the surrounding area, what must it have been like to be an American soldier knowing that people could pop up at any moment from a spider hole and be shooting at you, all of the different traps that they had. And I've seen some of the traps that they built for American soldiers, the punji sticks, the things that could cut the Achilles tendon. It was warfare in the extreme, warfare on a brutal scale. And this face right here, and the writing on that helmet band says it all. But even though it says it all, I don't think it says enough. Because it turns out that when it comes to war, there are different kinds of hell, aren't there? America went into Vietnam very confident, starting out like this guy on the left. Very confident, full of certainty, with a clear-eyed vision, with a goal in mind, at least we thought we had a goal. We ended Vietnam looking like the guy on the right. Somewhat frazzled, quite frankly, confidence was shattered. shattered. It would take maybe another 15, 20 years to get that confidence back. It would come back, and it would come back in a very big way. But it would take some real reorganization and self-reflection about what happened to us, not just in Vietnam, because we experienced Vietnam in Vietnam, but also in America. With the soldiers who came home, the women and men who came home, they came home from that experience changed and different, and because they were changed and different, they changed us and made us different as well. But the question, in putting this together, the question that confronted me was a question that always confronted me when it comes to Vietnam. What did we learn? Or even more specifically, did we learn anything at all? Did we learn anything? What did we learn? And, more specific, and even more specific than that, have we paid attention to what we learned? Have we put those lessons to work? Are we paying attention to them now? To answer that question, 
Did we learn anything? What did we learn? Are we applying the lessons now? I want us to fast forward to 1983. 1983 specifically, October 23rd, 1983. On October 23rd, 1983, something else happened that involved American servicemen overseas. It was the Beirut bombing. There had been the blowing up of the embassy in Beirut, Lebanon, followed by President Reagan deploying Marines to Beirut where they took up position at the Beirut International Airport. On October 23rd, a driver drove through, mar through the Marine barricade at the entrance and while people were shooting at him, came to the barricade, drove straight into the airport, blew it up. That says 220 Marines. The actual number was 234. I'll never forget that number because I was stationed at Camp Lejeune when that happened and I had friends of mine on base who spent weeks going from home to home on base or out in Jacksonville, North Carolina, knocking on doors saying, are you Mrs. So-and-so, are you Mr. So-and-so? I'm sorry to inform you, but 234 Marines, casualty call, who also are being sent home in body bags. Sailors, the destruction was a foreshadowing of the kind of terrorism we would eventually be dealing with one day. It was the beginning of a brand new type of warfare, not brand new, but the kind of warfare we didn't actually have to deal with in World War II or Korea, asymmetrical warfare, guerrilla style warfare, Vietnam warfare, but this time even more, even more unpredictable. As people tried to wrap their minds around what happened in Beirut, so things began to fall upon us and settle. Of course there was shock, there was dismay, but after the shock and the dismay came the anger. As more and more Marines' bodies were pulled out of the wreckage, people began to wonder, and of course the first thing that came upon people's minds, lips, as I recall at Camp Lejeune, was could this be the beginning of another Vietnam? Vietnam was always hovering in the background. It was always there. And it's 1983, meaning seven years or eight years after that last helicopter took off from the U.S. Embassy in downtown Saigon. And then the dull realization set in that we had to do something. How do you do this? When somebody attacks your troops like that in the field, a Maurice was sent there as a peacekeeping force. They were sent there because the Lebanese had been involved in the Civil War. And we go there to help people, and this is what happens? Time Magazine had it right. A few months earlier, Maurice had been deployed to Grenada to get rid of a communist government that was, at least people thought it would be, end up being like the Castro regime in Cuba. So we had sent Marines to Grenada and also now to Beirut. And people began to wonder and people began to say it was time for action. But here was the question. Time for action? When? What kind of action? How much action? And of course, I do remember among my fellow Marines, I remember within myself a feeling of revenge. I gave a presentation to the Marine Corps League on Saturday, on Saturday and I was, re, I was reacquainted with that phrase that no Marine leaves another Marine behind on the battlefield. Leave no one behind. It is a creed among all American service women and service men. You don't leave people behind. You look out for, your, you look out for the least one. As an officer you're taught that you feed the troops first, take care of yourself second, you leave no one behind. And so the idea of my fellow Marines, 234 of them being killed, I wanted to go over there and gather up as many as I could and t find out the people who were, who were they were that did this to my fellow Marines. So I have to admit, there were feelings of revenge. And when it came to the right time for action, the time for action, the right time for action, and if you did want to set up and take blood for blood since blood had been drawn, it wasn't like we didn't have the equipment. At the time, the F-14 Tomcat, shown here, was one of the top fighters in the world, if not the top fighter in the Navy inventory. Our troops, as always, were well supplied, well equipped, well trained, and highly motivated. In 1983, we had an all-volunteer military. The draft had ended. And in 1973, I believe it was, we went to what they call the ABF, the all-volunteer force. I think Ron went over that with you all. So we're not talking about people who are drafted 
The draftees did their duty, and we're grateful that they did their duty. We have people now that have joined the military. They're there. They want to be there, and they want to go and do their job. They're talented. They're motivated. They're smart, and they have all the proper training and equipment that they needed. The real question was, do we do it? Do we send them? And then where do they send them from? How do we send them? Listen, the idea of America having power has never been a question. We had the power, but it still did not answer the question about what to do. We could, if we wanted to, sent terrorist knee shaking just by sending an aircraft carrier battle group off the coast of, of Beirut. We could do that. We had all the capability to do what we wanted. But still, was it the right time for action? Covering in the background was Vietnam. At the time, the Secretary of Defense was Casper Weinberger. President Ronald Wilson Reagan was the President of the United States when that embassy was blown up. His sec death was Casper Weinberger, and Casper Weinberger, a former military man himself, on November 28, 1984, so now it's after the embassy's blown up, it's a little while after, at the National Press Club, Casper Weinberger delivered an address at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. At the time, Secretary Weinberger had as an assistant a military aide, General Colin Powell, which was a pretty interesting and a good, a good mix as far as talents go, go in, are concerned. So General Powell and Casper Weinberger worked together at the, sec at, at the Defense Department, and at that press club meeting, Casper Weinberger made the following, the following statements. Back one. Sorry. He said, restrictions, restrictions on the use of military forces are meant to sound a note. In other words, we, we did not go immediately into Beirut after the bombing because he didn't want to act too hastily. Restrictions are, on the use of military forces are meant to sound a note of caution. Caution that we must observe prior to committing forces to combat overseas. When we ask our military forces to risk their very lives in such situations, a note of caution is not only prudent, it is morally required. You did not hear that kind of language before Vietnam. You simply did not. But now after Vietnam, people are talking about, should we go? And if we go, how do we go? Why do we go? There's a phrase in Washington which says, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We clearly had a lot, we clearly had a hammer and lots of them. There were lots of nails out there to be pounded. You fast forward to 1990, something else happened. In August 1990, Saddam Hussein, shown on the right there, from the nation of Iraq, invaded his neighbor, Kuwait. There had been a long-standing dispute between the Kuwaitis and the Iraqis about the production of oil and cost, etc. and so on. And still, Vietnam was lurking in the background. Now, Colin Powell is no longer an assistant to the Secretary of Defense. He's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But before he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell had had another life. Here he is sitting before a congressional committee, Colin Powell, in a previous life, years before, had been on active duty and served in a place called Vietnam. And what happened, what happened afterward, when in, the, in getting the, the Iraqis out of Kuwait, would be very much determined by what he had experienced here in Vietnam, the lessons he learned there. Here he was as a young company commander in Vietnam. It was a Vietnamese children and a Vietnamese colleague. Colin Powell had seen war, he was there. He knew what it was like to be among people that were fighting war, those who were dying in war. So he worked his way up the chain of command. He did that first star, then eventually the second star, the third and fourth star, to become chairman of the JCS. When it came to determining how we were going to deal with the Iraq, deal with the Iraqis in Kuwait, Colin Powell said the following. 
If in the end war becomes necessary, track with me here. If in the end, in other words, after we have exhausted all of the possibilities, war becomes necessary as it clearly did in Operation Desert Storm. We exhausted every other possibility. What you're hearing is Colin Powell, who's gotten, who has learned from his boss, Casper Weinberger, who had the same viewpoint. They both were veterans of the Vietnam era. If you've done everything you can and war becomes necessary, as it did in Desert Storm, you must do it right. That has so much commentary. You must do it right, unlike the way we've done it before. You must do it right. Did we learn anything? It seems like we did, as far as, at least in this operation. What did we learn? We learned that we must do it right. You've got to go, you've got to be decisive. Colin Powell is talking about what I'm talking about right now. We had to do this time what we didn't do before. There was so much indecision. We didn't do it the right way. You gotta be decisive. You got to do it mad, you got to go in massively. You got to be wise and fight in a way that keeps casualties to a minimum. And you got to go in to win. Now many people found this to be problematic. What eventually came out of this was something called the Powell Doctrine. And the Powell Doctrine that was used in, in Operation Desert Storm can be, signed up, can be summed up by answering eight vital questions. Is a vital national security interest threatened? If it is, that's one box you check. Do we have a clear and attainable objective? Have the risk and cost been fully and frankly analyzed? And that would be both overseas and domestically. Have all other nonviolent policy beings been fully exhausted? In other words, have you exhausted all the tools, the tools of diplomacy? Is there a plausible exit strategy to avoid endless entanglement? In other words, is there a date when the mission is gonna be finished and we leave? Instead of just going on and on and on, what they call mission creep. Have the consequences of U.S. actions been fully considered domestically, internationally, our allies, our enemies? Is the action supported by the American people? In order for people in a democracy fighting a war, it's very difficult for a democracy to remain at war if the people in a democracy don't want the war, as long as the leaders continue acting like they're democratically elected. And do we have broad Genuine, broad, international support. Some people may say that's not necessary, that may not be necessary, because the United States, as it turns out, has enough air, land, and sea capability to deploy to some place like Iraq by itself, with or without international permission. But it's always better to go with friends. These are the questions that make up the power doctrine. If you, if you reinterpret them, wind them back a few years, these are the questions you might say, were not asked before we went to Vietnam. Was it a vital national security interest? At the time, they deemed it was. Do we have a clear and attainable objective? Many people would say we didn't. Have the risk and cost been fully and frankly analyzed? It's one thing to fully analyze them, but did we frankly analyze them? Did we put ourselves to the test? Did we tell ourselves the truth? Did we challenge ourselves? Were we brutally honest with ourselves about what this was going to happen to us? Have all other nonviolent policy means been fully exhausted? Not just addressed, but fully exhausted. Have you really turned over every stone to make sure that before you commit your nation's blood and treasure, your most valuable resource is young people to the fields of a foreign country? Have you really tried everything else? If you have, okay. But have you done it? Have you explored a possible exit strategy? First of all, do you have an exit strategy? Because to have an exit strategy, you gotta have something else, a mission. A mission requires an objective. Do you have a mission? Do you have an objective? And then when you achieve the objective, what are the means or the criteria for success? If you have all those, then once you achieve the objective and you have succeeded, what date, tentatively, do you plan on getting out? Do you plan to occupy the country? Do you leave a, a policing force? All these questions. Have the consequences of U.S. actions been fully considered? Not considered, but fully considered, fully and frankly. Did we have the support of the American people? It initially, initially we did, for a long, long time. And then, as I'm sure you all have seen over the last few weeks, there came that thing called Tet, 1968, when everything was stood on its head. Tet pulled the cover off of it, it pulled the curtain back, and we saw the truth. For goodness sake, even Walter Cronkite went overseas to see for himself what was going on. And when Cronkite came back, he didn't say we were losing the war, but he also, what was more important than saying 
What's more important than him saying we weren't losing the war, what he didn't say was that we weren't winning the war. People heard that part. And then we had brought, then we had genuine broad international support. Do we in Vietnam? For a time we did, and then we didn't. Those questions were asked during Desert Storm. They were, they were asked and they were addressed and they were answered to the satisfaction of policymakers. So we deployed to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait to get Saddam Hussein out of that country. It was a quick operation. It was successful. And it was a nice return for the world to see American military arms effective, precise, winning, coordinated, and operating like a force meant to win. Some of the best equipment in the world, with some of the best trained soldiers and sailors, marines, airmen in the world, taking on a local bully, proving that dictatorship can have a short lifespan, using all of the tools in our arsenal. We have found the nail, we were using the hammer, but there was still the legacy of Vietnam hovering in the background. Always Vietnam was there. So even as the troops came home to a very, very happy, joyful welcome, so much unlike our Vietnam veterans who came home to something far different. The troops from Desert Storm came home to bands and ticker tape parades and hugs and, and flowers and all kinds of just congratulations. And our Vietnam veterans, they noticed that. They noticed the kind of welcome that those Iraqi troops got, those Iraqi service troops got that they didn't get. Some of the lessons learned One of the lessons learned from Vietnam was the ending of the draft. Now, I can tell you from talking to my college students that they, they're still required to sign up with the Selective Service, the, the Selective Service Commission. So they're still required to register, but we still have not implemented the draft since Vietnam. As of this afternoon, when I double checked this, as of November 15th, 2021, the United States military has been all volunteers since 1973 but an act of Congress could still reinstate the GRAV in case of a national emergency. The Selective Service System is an is agency that reg registers men and is responsible for running a draft. So for the moment, we have not had a national emergency that's been deemed serious enough to reactivate this. But that's also because our fighting women and men have proven to be so effective and so lethal around the world where they've been sent, the draft has not been necessary. Another lesson that we learned from Vietnam. You know, I decided to focus on things that are not, that are not so much uh, tactically, strategically dri driven. This one, I hope is a little more human-centered. The one, another lesson we learned from Vietnam, having had several Vietnam veterans in my own family, we learned to say thank you to people coming back from overseas. That was not done. That was criminal. That was a, that was a great, great error. That was a great, great faux pas. And today, I tell my college students that today, when people, when Veterans Day comes around, when you go to these different parades and whatnot, and people are saying, thank you for your service, I tell them that is a very recent manifestation in American history. Once upon a time, people were not saying that. And we say, thank you for your service today, because we realize collectively as a society that we didn't do it. That a bunch of other young people who after all were only 18, 19, 20 years old, they were young people too, they didn't want to go. The draft was there, they went, and did a, they went and did a hard thing that became an unpopular thing, but they did it anyway. Like Americans have done every generation. They went and they did it, and they came home to a profoundly repugnant, repulsive, no thank you. And in many cases, why did you come home? The kind of things that I have been told Vietnam veterans heard upon returning to their homes and communities just makes, it just makes your skin crawl. Young people went out to fight in those kind of conditions. And maybe because I have been in Vietnam and have been in some of those jungle areas and have seen what it's like to see triple canopy jungle and on dirt different days, because we try to go to Vietnam with the students when it's not real hot, but on some days it has gotten really, really hot. I cannot even imagine what it would have been like to be over there carrying a full combat load and a radio and an M16 and two cans, cans of water and sea rations or whatever kind of rations they were eating 
with the with the with the swamp and all of the, the, the diseases and so forth in the jungle. And then to add on top of all that, you're far away from home, you don't know what's going on, you're young, you're scared, you're stressed out, and by the way, people are trying to kill you too. They deserve better than they got. So yes, a big lesson that we learned and that the soldiers and men and women from Desert Storm received as a result of learning that lesson was a big thank you. Parades and bands, the way it should be done. Another lesson we learned was making sure that all hands are on deck. That you have broad support across the nation and internationally. If you recall that before Desert Storm, President Bush, George H.W. Bush, he was masterful in getting together an international coalition. He kept the American people informed. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do it. He went on TV several times making these addresses. But before we went into, before Desert Storm started, there was a thing called Desert Shield. We watched it in the news for weeks, the buildup. So that when Desert Storm started, people knew when it was gonna go, approximately, what the objective was, and approximately when we were gonna get out. We were so well informed compared to Vietnam. Another lesson that we learned. In reading about the Powell Doctrine, I came across this, one of the people, that, one of the folks who criticized the Powell Doctrine, because the Powell Doctrine has its critics. There are not very many people who think that, you know, it's, it is the way we should go, we should work when it comes to the military. But one of the critics, one of the criticisms was, Americans are, don't have what it takes to fight a protracted war. Vietnam showed us that. The, the, the French got defeated at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, and it was soon thereafter that American advisors started, started trickling into Vietnam. And then, of course, with the Johnson administration, the full troop buildup after the 1964 Gulf of Tonkin incident, then the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, then the full-on filled up with the landing at Da Nang in 1965, and then it just rolled forward until I think you have about a half million men at Da Nang, a major supply base. And then we were there until, in some form or fashion in Vietnam until 1975. Although the troop withdrawal started in 1973, we're finally there taking out the last of our troops in the embassy in 1975. 21 years or 10 years, however you want to count it, from Dien Bien Phu or from the troop buildup, either way, that's a long time, a decade or more. So some people say, in criticizing the Powell Doctrine, that can Americans endure a protracted war? Vietnam said maybe not. On the other hand, sometimes when you're stuck, frustrated, and discouraged, you ask a better question. Maybe instead of asking can Americans endure a protracted war, a better question is should Americans endure a protracted war? Because Afghanistan has shown us that we, have been, we can be in an area of combat for 20 years. That's how long we've been in Afghanistan. It turns out that the American people can't take it. Not everyone's happy about it. We pulled out recently, but if we have to, it turns out that we can do it. So maybe there are some other modifications we can learn from the so-called Powell Doctrine. Another criticism, I just, want to, I just want to focus on one of the points of the Powell Doctrine that people also identify problems with. This, this, group, this entire, all these questions grow out of our experience in Vietnam. All these questions come out of Colin Powell's working with Casper Weinberger at Defense. All these questions have looming over them, the shadow of Vietnam, looking at the next time you do it, remember me. Don't make the same errors. Don't do the same things. Do it a different kind of way. One of the things we need to interrogate is a vital national security interest threatened. That question is not nearly as easily answered today as it once might have been. On December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, clearly our national interest was being threatened. In World War I, when the Germans were waging unrestricted submarine warfare, sinking American vessels, our national interest was being clearly threatened. In the Cold War, national interest was a lot more difficult and tricky to define. To define. For example, in 1947, President Harry Truman took what would have been the traditional view of American foreign policy, that is, if we are attacked directly, if the, home, if the homeland is directly threatened, we will fight, understandably, reasonably, justifiably. That's easy, that's cut. It's left, right, up, down, black, white. There's no difficulty understanding that. 
But Harry Truman in 1947, it's the Cold War now. And he said, he's redefining American foreign policy in a different kind of way. We will fight even if, he said, the United States would provide political, military, and economic assistance to all democratic nations under threat from external or internal authoritarian forces. The Truman Doctrine effectively reoriented U.S. foreign policy away from its usual stance, will fight if we are directly threatened, that's the usual stance, to, to withdraw from regional conflicts not directly involving the United States to one of possible intervention in far away conflicts. Can you see how this opened the, opened the door to Korea and Vietnam? Then after Harry Truman, came President Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower, another president of the Cold War, in the early Cold War, said a country could request American economic assistance and or aid from U.S. military forces if it was being threatened by armed aggression from another state. How do you define national interest there? At what point? Because those statements are very broad. And depending upon who your allies are, depending upon the war, depending upon the likelihood of you being attacked, your economic interest, a whole range of things, it might fit that criteria, which had you sending people off to Korea and Vietnam, or Grenada, or Lebanon, or Guatemala, or El Salvador, as we did in the 1980s. And then finally, the next one, President Richard Nixon, who for all for all of his drawbacks, for all of his for all of his uh, his challenges. President Nixon is still identified as being one of the one of the one of our great foreign policy presidents. He really had a knack for it. He loved foreign policy. He loved meeting with foreign leaders. On July 25th, 1965, 1969, while on a tour through Asia, while traveling through Asia, he was interviewed and he said, "Looking down to the end of the century, Asia poses the greatest threat to the peace of the world, and for that reason, the United States should continue to play a significant role in Asia." He wasn't wrong. He says, Asians do not want to be dictated to from outside. He's right there as well. And that is what we want for Asians to be independent. And that is the role we should play. We should assist, but we should not dictate. We, of course, will keep the treaty commitments that we have, but as far as our role is concerned, we must avoid the kind of policy that will make countries in Asia so dependent upon us that we are dragged into conflicts such as the one we have in Vietnam. When we first went into Afghanistan, and one year turned into two years, and two years turned into three years, and three years turned into four years, and four years turned into five years. How many of you all heard people saying, how many did, did you think this is going to be like another Vietnam? Did you hear anyone say that? Did you hear, did you read in the papers? So Vietnam loomed over everything. Vietnam looms over everything. And we have, we have paid attention. We have learned some lessons, but as I asked at the beginning, we have learned some lessons. What are those lessons? Have we paid attention? Have we applied the lessons? And then, even with the power doctrine, the power doctrine was wonderful for a certain kind of warfare. A, a, a state, a nation state, Iraq, invades a neighbor with tanks and airplanes. That sounds like traditional warfare. What they, okay, that, that sounds like traditional warfare, conventional warfare. We can respond to that. We can respond to that. We have the equipment, we have the hammer for that kind of a nail. But then, with the advent of the 21st century, came a new kind of warfare, one even more deadly, still warfare, threats, trends, and things that, the limitations that show up, that prove to us that we have a big hammer, but can we use it in every situation, such as when this guy showed up. We have seen that there have been all kinds of studies done that show that there were so many things, so many balls that were dropped on the way toward 9-11. The person that made the phone call from the Florida flight school saying you got a bunch of people, look, they're, they look like they're from a different part of the world. They're interested in taking, they want to learn how to fly, but they're not interested in landing. That should have been a red flag of all kinds. I don't know about you all, but when I get on an airplane, if it goes up, I want it to come down safely. I'm going to qualify it. When people are getting on an airplane and they don't, want to, they don't want to know how to land it, who could have ever foreseen? We know the Japanese did this during World War II, turning fighter planes into flying bombs, but the idea of using commercial airliners as flying bombs? Frankly, I don't know, maybe you all know something different. For me, this caught me off guard. And I have been, I have been tracking this stuff. 
They tried to do it, blow up the World Trade Center in 1993 with a truck bomb. They couldn't take it out from below, so they took it out from above. And boy, did they take it out. It led us to declare a global war on terror, a global war on terror. And even then, the power doctrine, which was okay for one type of warfare for one era, found its limitations. We had something different to deal with. It was called Al-Qaeda Al and ISIS. They're fighting, in a, they're fighting in an old kind of way, but in a new kind of way. And we're trying to wrap our minds around that right now. We're developing tactics and strategies to deal with them. In some cases, we have been very successful. In we have been very successful, but we still have much to learn. So we can acknowledge we have a very big hammer, and we do know what, and we do know how to swing it. And we have the right kind of nails. There are nails out there waiting. There are nails out there begging to be hammered. We just have to make sure we do it the right way. The legacy of Vietnam. The legacy of Vietnam tells us, among other things, the legacy gives us a warning. 58,000 of them, whose names are inscribed in the wall in Washington, D.C. 58,000 young people who would not come back. Vietnam is a friend now, as opposed to what this map, this battle map shows what they were at one point. We recognize the name. These are the names that as a child I grew up with. Play Ku, Khan Tung, An Hoa, Duck To, Quang Nai, Kwe, Da Nang. These were the things that I heard my uncle and my father talking about. These were the, these were the things that filled up my ears and, and, and were the, in the ether as I, as I came of age. So the legacy of Vietnam, we have threats out there beyond America's borders. There are, threat, there are people that mean to do us harm right now, this moment as I'm speaking to you. And those threats have to be responded to with a hammer of some type. We have to have the right tools to respond to that threat, and we will respond to that threat. Another legacy, because there are threats out there that are, and if this is not just, you know, being hysterical, we are, we are a great nation, we are a superpower. And there are people that would like to have that change. And because they would like to have that happen, we must be prepared. When I was in Washington, D.C., growing up in Washington, D.C., when I started attending college at Bowie State University, I often would go downtown on the subway, and coming up from the tunnel, coming up on either Independence Avenue or Pennsylvania Avenue, I would walk to the National Archives and see these words on the front. These words never failed to inspire me. These words never failed to just make me feel a chill, a positive chill. Eternal vigilance is the price, for, the price of liberty. The legacy of Vietnam also requires us to remember the soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, Coast Guard women and men, who, as Abraham Lincoln said, gave the last full measure to not forget what they did, to know that they did their part just like the veterans in Korea, the veterans in Vietnam, the veterans in Grenada, the veterans of Iraq, the veterans of Beirut, all of them, all of them have done their part in being eternally vigilant so that we can enjoy this liberty. I think I've told you all the story of a few years ago when a number of my students were going down to the School of the Americas. They said, Professor Johnson, come with us. We're going down to, to protest American warmongering and the way they're teaching these South American these South American troops to be paramilitaries and just beat up on indigenous people in, in Central America. I said, no, I'm not going to go with you all, but I want you to go. So no, come on, Professor Johnson, you're really a cool guy. And, well, at least I like to think I'm cool, but anyway. They said, you know, we like you. Come on down there with us. You can be with us. I said, no, no, you go. And they finally said, well, why don't you go with us? I said, listen, I want you to go because it's your right as an American to go and exercise your freedom of speech. First Amendment privileges, that's what, that's what we have it for. I said to them, but here's what I want you to do for me. When you get down there and start protesting and you know, stomping on the flag and doing whatever you're going to do, remember that there's a 19-year-old just like you walking a guard post many thousands of miles away from here buying you the right to do what you're doing. 
while they're walking that guard post defending the flag that you stomp on, remember, you don't get to stomp on that flag for free. They're earning you that moment. And then they went and did what they did. So I want them to remember that. And I always tell my students to remember our veterans, our Vietnam veterans, our Korean War veterans, our Iraq veterans, Desert Storm, Gulf War I, Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom, all of them, remember them. Remember, I urge them to remember, I'm teaching a US military history class this semester, I have, and I have constantly pounded this theme. Remember, 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 remember that when you drive up 31 going north to Grand Rapids and get off at, at, at Wealthy Street, okay. I tell them, remember, remember that these were young people too. Look at how young they are. Look at their faces. They are so young. They are so young to be doing such an important thing so far away. They are so young to have that kind of burden placed upon them. Young people, I don't know if they were meant to do this, maybe just because they physically can. My hips and my knees won't do it, but mentally, emotionally, I should be there. But there they were, they're young people, they're the cream of the crop. They are the best that we have in any moment, drafty or not. They're the best in that moment. Look at what they're doing. They're doing it far away from home. They're getting wounded and caring for each other. They're, they're, they're afraid, but they're not running away. They're still carrying the ammunition. Look at their faces. The Vietnam War fought from 1965 to 1975. The troop buildup in 1965. 1965, three, two years after the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech. Ten years after Emmett Till's lynching in, in, in Money, Mississippi. Nine years after the Montgomery bus boycott. A full-blown civil rights movement in the streets of America, but out in the fields of Vietnam, in the jungles in the bush of Vietnam, these guys from different backgrounds, different origins, different skin colors, different races, they figured it out. It's not about our differences. It's about fighting together. It's about looking out for each other. It's about doing this the right way. Because in Vietnam, as in Korea, there's no room for all that foolishness. There's no, there's no time for division. There's no time for petty differences. All the thing that matters, we don't fight for the people back home. We're fighting for each other. There's a bond and a connection between soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, Coast Guards persons that can't be duplicated. Some people have gone so far as to say that they get closer than even a man and a wife will become because they've gone through a common experience of great trial and great testing and they can't explain it to anyone else. To use a cliche, you simply had to be there. Their faces tell the story of people who quite frankly would rather have been doing something else these guys should have been out fishing, walking through the park with their girlfriend, or shining their car. But they were in Vietnam, doing the heavy work of democracy. They should have been planning a weekend at the beach. They should have been talking about what they're gonna study their first year in college. They should have been going for a hike in the Colorado Rockies. But they were over there in Vietnam doing the heavy work of democracy. And so 58,000 of them did the heavy work of democracy and were a better nation for it. We finally remember to say thank you. And still we can't say thank you enough. We can't say thank you enough for all that the Vietnam veterans did for us. I have to pause each time I see this, this picture because I tell my students, you know, it's kind of interesting talking to 18, 19, 20 year olds because they, they can't conceive of themselves, they can't even conceive of themselves being 40. They can barely, they can barely come to grips with the fact that they may be 30 one day. And I told them that once upon a time like them, this guy 
was 19, 18, 17. He had dreams, he had hopes, he had lots of energy. He had things he wanted to do besides go to Vietnam. But then he went and he went with some people that he met in boot camp maybe, or maybe that, that he met with his first unit. They went through basic training together. They learned their infantry tactics together. Then they deployed to Vietnam together and they became like his new family. These guys became more than brothers to him. They became brothers in arms, which on the one hand, maybe it's not as close as a blood brother, but on the other hand, maybe it's closer than a blood brother. Maybe a blood brother would never go through those things with you. And because they went through them together, another thing happened between these, these, these individuals. Something called love. Love for each other. That agape love. That has them watching each other's back. And caring for each other. And sharing food. And looking over each other itself. And knowing that without any one of them in the unit, they can't be the same. So he comes there remembering who he was back then. When he leans against that wall, his friends show up every time to say, look, we're not here, but we're not gone. And when you get ready to join us, we'll be there waiting for you. Because we went through this together. You're one of us. Sure, we left early, but we're not gonna leave you behind. You know why? Because the motto in the military is leave no one behind. No one gets left behind. Nobody gets left behind. I really appreciate you all letting me share with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you for another wonderful presentation. Do we have any questions in the audience tonight? Or for those of you that are on Zoom, and I will announce you so that we're not surprised by your voices. Feel free to unmute yourself, and if you have a question, to ask your questions. Yes, sir. Okay, Korea. Because we're still there. Oh, I forgot. Korea, because we're still there, uh, what kind of action is that? Why haven't we pulled out of, out of there? That's a real good question. Do we have a, was there, was there definitely a, a, a mission statement there? I think that a fast answer for why we're still there in Korea is because we're there as a holding force and a check against the North Koreans to protect the South Korean ally. South Korea is a major ally in that part of the world, in East Asia as they call it, with Japan. And given the, given the, given the fact that the North Koreans are backed by the Chinese, who have definitely been aggressive in recent years, we're there as a power, as a, as a power check to offset the influence of North Korea in the region. So as part through treaty obligations, remember Nick, President Nixon said we're going to we're going to live up to our treaty obligations. One of those things is a, it is a defense pact that we have with the South Koreans to be there to help defend them along against their North Korean adversaries, who shall have shown every indication that I don't know if they will attack, but they're also not trying to make friends real fast either. That's one of the explanations. We one of the explanations why we're still there. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a good question, though, because it, it, it brings up the fact, it brings up this fact that in 1953, we didn't sign a peace treaty with Korea, we signed a ceasefire. And a ceasefire means exactly what it says. I agree to not shoot at you if you don't shoot at me. So as long as both parties honor that, there'll be no war. But we are still technically in a state of war with Korea. And because of that, again, to back up our South Korean allies and also to protect Japan in that entire region, what they call Australasia, East Asia, it's a good idea for America to still be there. Other questions? Yes, sir. Do we know, <clears throat> excuse me, do we know how effective the current selective service is at, at registering all the available mails that should be registered? The question is, do we know how, do we know how effective the current selective service is at registering all the available mails who are supposed to be registered? I'll give you an anecdotal response which will not cover the, the scope of what I think you're talking about. But whenever I ask my students, have they registered? All my male students say, yes, they have. Just required and they have done it dutifully. So just based on that small sampling, I think that they, they know when they turn 18, they register and get it out the way and just do it and hope that nothing's gonna happen. That's a good answer. Thanks. I, I yes, sir. What, 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 what classes do you actually teach then uh, at the uh, college? I teach US military history, modern European history, History of U.S. Foreign Policy, U.S. History to 1877, 
Slavery and Rage, 1619, the present, American Revolution, the American Civil War, uh, History of the Black Church. You know what? That's a lot. They really should be paying me more. <laughs> I'll give you a raise. <laughs> Thanks. I wish I had you as a teacher. Thank you. But but most of them, I'm I'm, an, I'm what they call an Americanist. So most of my classes, you know, focus on America and primarily military. Uh, yeah, military and overseas foreign policy. That that sort of thing. I'm really been pretty much interested in all that kind of those kind of subjects all of my life. Any from Zoom? Any Zoom questions? No Zoom questions tonight. Um, I really, I, I can't. Hey, I'm I, I enjoy, I, I'm enjoying being in front of a live audience. Zoom is okay, but it's okay. Seeing your faces and being in the room with you is better, really, really better. Yes, ma'am. I'll wait. Thank you for all of you, all of the research you've done and all of your lectures. I've enjoyed all of them. Even the ones you did on Zoom, I've watched several of them too from last year. Thank you. And thank you to all the veterans that are out there. Uh, you have really enlightened us on a lot of what people went through and what they're still going through. So thank you very much. Right. Thank you but for that last comment. You know, I told my students that one, one day that I was, I was on the way up to Grand Rapids and I saw Someone standing there at 31 and wealthy when I got off of wealthy, and he was holding a sign saying, he was holding a sign saying, veteran, anything will help. And I told that, I, I remember talk, telling that story to a colleague, and there were some students laughing about that later on. And then later on in class, I said, listen, let me tell you something. The individual standing up there, well, 31 and wealthy, they may look, they may look like they're down and out and on hard, you know, on hard look right now. I said, but let me assure you that when they were 18 years old, that wasn't their plan. Wasn't there a plan to be standing out there in February holding a sign saying, veteran, anything will help? I say, you need to have some humility because you don't know where life is going to take you, what life is going to do to you. Life is going to do some things to you that will stretch you out, lay you flat, and strip you clean if you're not careful. And remember, that guy's a veteran. He's done a difficult thing. You don't know what happened to him or her that has them standing out there. Show a little grace and mercy, why don't you? So thank you. Do we have any other questions this evening? No, I'll make a comment though. Yes. That's you, Cliff. Uh, you've done. You did a marvelous job of uh, relating the uh, civil wars that we, the actual civil wars that we participated in, and why you uh, you, you brought that down to uh, a one-hour marvelous presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Cliff. You know, I was looking for something from the Kennedy, the Kennedy administration. Kennedy's foreign policy wasn't all that great. And Lyndon Johnson, of course, he, everything, everything that he wanted to do foreign policy-wise got sucked up by Vietnam. His, his entire presidency was hobbled, kneecapped because of Vietnam. So it ended up being the tone set by Harry Truman, then built upon by Dwight Eisenhower, and articulated expertly by Richard Nixon, who, as I say, still has a reputation for being a, a pretty savvy foreign policy president. So, Thanks for that observation, Cliff. Well deserved. Thank you. Um, when your students walk into your class right now, what is their basis of knowledge of American history as a freshman walking into college? You know, some of them, some of them, Peg, they, they come in. I have, a, I have a number of them who are AP scholars, the advanced program scholars. So I have a number of them who have completed the AP program in high school. And they're pretty knowledgeable, but then there's there, but then there are the other ones, you know, who just they, they take they, they sign up for the U.S. history class. They're going to check a box and move on to do their move on to their golf game and do the really fun stuff. And this is where we start we start having conversations about Shays Rebellion in 1786 and how that can, and how that was the precursor the, the the catalyst for convening at the Constitutional Convention or the Missouri Crisis of 1819 1820. They're knowledgeable. But they're also there. There are vast gaps in their knowledge, and I tell them that, among other things, that I'm what I'm what I find myself doing these days. In addition to teaching history, of course, I want them to know the content. But what I'm really focusing upon these days, and I've been for the last few years, is teaching them critical thinking by using the discipline of history. I've told them that in every job I've had, most of them that I wasn't qualified for, 
Critical thinking that I learned as an historian helped me keep my job, sometimes literally a roof over my head. So we practice critical thinking and I asked them questions. For example, in my modern European, in my modern European class, I, I know in the midterm, I asked them a question that does, went something like this. Some, some historians have asserted that the, indu the Industrial Revol Revolution was a major event in European history that benefited everybody. Others say that it caused more harm than good. Some historians say that it was the French Revolution that actually benefited more Europeans. Compare and contrast those two events and assess which of the two was better for average Europeans. Now, you can't do any of that, first of all, if you don't have the content. And you certainly cannot explain it if you don't know how to write and explain yourself. And you cannot even begin to talk about it if you don't know how to critically think. And I tell them, I'm not asking for the right answer. Of course I want the right dates, facts, people, places. I, I don't want an error, I mean, I don't want errors there, but what I'm really looking for is how did you structure an argument? How did you explain yourself? And then, at some point in the semester, I start sharing with them testimonials that I've gotten back from students, one who's a logistics officer in the U.S. Army, who wrote me an email about two years ago and said, Professor Johnson, all that stuff you said about critical thinking and writing and logical thinking has got me promoted. Then another one, who was gonna be a, a teacher at a high, school, a high school in Michigan, but the year she graduated, they weren't hiring, so she ended up working for a pharmaceutical company. Professor Johnson, I'm not even working in history now, but I got promoted because my, my supervisor found out I could write and think. The stuff in your classes. Another one who's a Chicago police officer. He, he's working on the south side of Chicago in a predominantly African-American neighborhood, and I talked to Kyle before I left. I said, I want you to be careful out there. I said, because, you know, race relations in America are pre pretty, pretty shoddy today. But he wrote me back and he said, Professor Johnson, I never thought, I didn't really think I would use the skills you taught me in class, but because I, have been, I can fill out a police report better than my peers, I got promoted. So I told him, you know what? You should be a history major. <laughs> <laughs> It'll get you a job, it get you promoted, and that'll put more money in your pocket. <laughs> so I teach them the content, and we go on from there. And it's just a, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to work with young people and close those con content gaps. Well, if there's no other questions this evening, I'll thank everyone for being on this 10-week journey with us. And thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's, it's getting cold. It is November in Michigan, right? <laughs> cold and wet. And I tell you, if, if you had to come through the traffic in Grand Haven, I'm doubly <laughs> grateful to you. So thank you. And um, we will be starting our spring lecture series on the third Tuesday in February. And as I said, it'll be on World War II in the Pacific. And we're going to be looking at all the different aspects of it, going in a time-honored manner to see all the different things. Because unfortunately, we tend to spend a lot more time on the European uh, conflict of World War II. But the World War II in the Pacific, not only just because our submarines served in the Pacific, and not only just because our Coast Guard cutter happened to have sank a Japanese submarine off the coast of Alaska during World War II, but it's one of those topics where knowledge is very important, and it's one of our ways of honoring our veterans and serving our mission here of honoring our veterans through education and preservation is of the utmost. So thank you everyone for coming. We appreciate you, and we appreciate all you do by coming here and learning about these things. Please encourage people to look at our YouTube channel and watch some of our lectures, and we hope to see you all again in February. And if you cannot come in February, you know where to get the link from for Zoom. So thank you all, and have a wonderful evening.